Saran. Hi. How I'm are so you? Oh, do you know what? I've just I've been waiting to do this for so long, but never had the balls to do it. And so now it feels like, oh, I'm finally I finally got there. So I'm thrilled. Thank you for everything you do, because you're just you've just been with me through all of my dark times. So, yeah, big thank you to you. Oh, my God, I feel like crying already. Um, <laughs> well, I'm I'm particularly grateful and. You know, that's exactly why I love doing this and I like creating this space so that, you know, whoever it is that comes on the podcast can just chat and also be liberated. I think there there comes a time where you feel like you want to just say it as it is or you want to just be you on the, you know, the sort of platform that you're on with the with the public eye gazing at you. It's it, it maybe is scary, but also seriously liberating and you know, of course, this isn't necessarily the first time that you will have, you know, talked about personal things, but also expressed a really deep and intimate part of yourself, because I know that that is interwoven into everything that you do with your acting work and every character that you play, you're, you're drawing on, you know, things that you've experienced and things that you understand about life. And no more so than the beautiful bit of television that I've just been lucky enough to have a preview of, I Am Victoria, which is an extraordinary piece of work and deeply moving and unbelievably raw and nuanced and detailed. And it completely took my breath away. And at times I was like very close to home, which was kind of like, <laughs> oh shit, I need to sort myself out. And I know that, um, that with the, the writer and director, Dominic Savage, you, you collaborated to, to, bring Victoria to life and also improvised a lot of the dialogue. So what was it that you wanted to explore within yourself or express with, with this particular piece of work? <clears throat> well, firstly, I think, um, I think just to say why it's taken me so long to, to come and, and chat to you is because I, I do have that outlet, like, you know, in my uh, work and through other people's scripts or through I Am Victoria, I'm able to, um, put all my feelings and, and channel them but it's not me so there's always that kind of like um gap between reality and um and entertainment so and also as you know um and as i've heard you talk about on here uh, the fear of anything i say <laughs> being taken as a headline and um, you know, being blown out of proportion. I think people are savvy enough now to know that, you know, they can go and listen to a, a, a full conversation on a podcast. But that's that's why I've, I've kind of held back before. Um, but, but making I'm Victoria was so liberating um, that I felt like I may as well talk about how it came about because I think it might help people. <clears throat> um, and it's a love letter to mental health. It's a love letter to those uptight mums at the school gates, um, to the mums that are harassed at the school gates, to the people down the gym that go to the gym too much that we may judge. Um, it's a love letter to mental health to say, I see you and it doesn't have to be a big trauma. I see you day to day. I see how modern life um, affects a, a middle-aged woman, um, affects anybody, how social media, how 50 looks when it's JLo, um, you know, it, it was all those things that I needed to kind of get out. And Dominic helped me put it into one character. Um, but, but originally when I met Dominic, um, my, my story was gonna be about when I lost my mom, which is stuff I've talked about before and about having a baby and then losing my mom um, shortly after. But the more I thought about it, the more that wasn't going to be, it was, it was going to be too personal to me. And I didn't know how that would translate and how it would help other people. But this, how, how I am Victoria's come about, and I'm glad you say you recognize yourself in moments. Um, this is about a woman who's trying to control what's happening to her and using all the tools that we hear, um, using podcasts and exercise and sleep sprays and um, singing bells on the, you know, on the, um, not singing bells, singing bowls, singing bells or bowls, <laughs> whatever, whatever it works for you. Whatever floats your boat. Yeah, exactly. Um, yoga and um, massage and 
because I think a conversation needs to happen around what's good for you and what you're trying to control. Do you know what I mean? I do know what you mean, because also there's a there's a huge problem with how not only mental health often talked about, but the solutions around just feeling any sort of equilibrium in life, because we are prescribed all of these things that have been somewhat commercialized, commodified, like doing all the things you've just listed, which can be beneficial in ways to well-being, but they're not necessarily going to be the game changer. And the game changer is doing the inside work, which is harder than all of those things listed, more boring than all those things listed, yep. take yep. way more time than all those things listed. So I really recognize, you know, I, I, I think I fall into both camps because I'm more than willing to do the inside work and I've committed to it every day and I don't it, succeed at it every day, but it's, it's my life now. But I still try and, I guess, reduce anxieties or manipulate how I'm reacting to the world by like in with Victoria having the cold shower and going oh my god what, why I feel better after having the cold shower yeah. or whatever it is and those things won't fix us they might make us feel a bit better but we've got to do the inside work and I think the element of control that you dissected in I Am Victoria was fascinating and they're the bits that I really grabbed hold of because they resonated on such a level because when I feel out of control mentally or I'm not reacting well to what's going on around me I micromanage and I'm doing what Victoria did. I'm wiping after I've had the coffee and it's just, and I realized, God, I actually still need much more help with that element of life with being able to let go and just not worry about the chaos because it's, yeah. it's uncontrollable. Yeah. And, 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 and hopefully, you know, that, that bit where she's wiping stuff, you can feel how rigid she is because she, she's clinging on to the, the tiniest of things. And it's really heartbreaking because what she needs to do is go away and meditate and feel herself, give her space time. I was listening to one of your podcasts the other day about <clears throat> booking in time for yourself. And if you are someone like Victoria, you have to plan those moments where you, you have clarity, <clears throat> you hear yourself, you breathe. I mean, God, the amount of times I, I've been out of control in the way that she is. I mean, thank God I've I've had a lot of therapy. I've been on medication, off medication. I, I've been to a dark time. And now, like you, I'm, I can recognise when I'm spiralling out of control. And um, I've also heard you say that everything gets too loud. So one thing can spark me. And then suddenly my relationship gets too loud with my husband. My, my boy asking me to... Um, the Ghostbusters, you, you know, it's too loud for me. It's too much for me. Um, the dogs um, have rolled in some shit somewhere. It's the end of the fucking world, you know. And and if I just take myself off, I can understand that that's fine. And and also the love letter I'm trying to get across is that some people might hear this and go, "So what's wrong with you?" It, I, I don't quite, I don't quite understand. So so what? See, what do you mean it gets loud when the dog rolls in shit? And it, Dominic came up with this brilliant um, way of, because we often say that when you're, um, when you when you're dealing with mental health and, and you can't see it, like you can see a broken leg or a, a cut or a bruise. And Dominic said, we need to come up with a way of seeing Victoria's um, unrest. And so when she's getting ready and she's putting on her face or when she's looking in the mirror, when she's talking to herself, when she's, um, she's preempting what someone's gonna to say to her at the supermarket. So she's got her um, parlor talk ready. Those are the moments that I think Dominic has shone in, in trying to get across what it is that's going on in here. So that an audience can go, oh, I see. So it's, so it's just all going on. So you can't actually hear and see and taste life in the way that you should be doing. And I, I thought that was, beautiful because that was him that you know I, I went to him with the story but he had to visualize it and I I think it's really important as we move on in our conversations of mental health to for people to understand what we mean yeah aren't we just all at full capacity as well like I think a lot of people will totally get it and go oh I know that feeling where 
it's just we're trying to do so much and and the notion of perfectionism which has probably always been true to people throughout history has never been more prevalent on mass yeah and we and that is because we are presented with a notion of what success and happiness looks like and what you've done is you know gone into the subterranean levels of that to go oh it looks like that but look what's happening it's you know the classic swan thing of being all I look lovely on top but underwater going absolute bananas and I think so many of us feel like that because you know it's not natural to live in the way that we're living and it's and it's so recent like I, I love thinking about how recent all of this is and that you know a couple of hundred years ago people would have looked at us going what are you doing like, <laughs> right? why are you running around and doing like even my nan who's you know bless her long well both my nan's long gone now but I can imagine them going why are you doing so many yeah. things in a day I don't understand but we've yeah. normalized it and I don't think any of us are truly coping with it perhaps on varying levels but you know they're that lovely well it's not lovely for Victoria at all but there's this very poignant moment where she drops the plate of canopies and just mm. everything goes to shit at that point. And mm. I've had that moment so many times where I remember once I was rushing around and I didn't want to go to this dinner I had to go to and I was stressed. I didn't feel I looked very nice and I smashed my head on the car bonnet and then <sighs> I just sat on the drive and cried and cried and just said, I'm not going. I'm not going. I didn't want to bloody go anyway. But you had to get yourself to that place yeah. to not go. And it's yeah. crazy. Oh my God, how many oh. times? Yeah. <laughs> How many and, times? And that thing of, um, so, I mean, thank God I, I'm less Victoria now, but I think I used to be very much like, well, I can't go because I haven't got anything to wear I don't, uh, with a wardrobe full of things to wear. Um, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm going to sweat. I'm going to, um, I'm going to say something idiotic. I'm going to do the weird um, posh queen voice that I do sometimes. <laughs> it's, ridiculous i went to this event once it's so embarrassing i can't even tell you which one so people can't look it up but <laughs> someone asked me to um give them an award and i was like oh okay this, this person was quite you know i thought oh that's quite spunky great i'll go and do that at the moment i got the invitation but that was the best bit and i should have left it there hung the invitation up and not gone anyway i ended up going I looked very odd because I was in a panic. Um, everyone I met, and there was some really great people there too, that I would have just loved to have had a normal conversation with. I stared at like I wanted to kill them because of I was so frightened of being there. The sweat started to happen. And then the voice came out and I was like, oh my God, stop doing that. But I was talking like this to people. Oh my God. And it, it must have been this, like um it, everything screaming inside yeah. run away run away yeah or is it what i wanted them to see came out like that because it wasn't obviously authentic so it my body was having such a fucking laugh at me and saying all right well i'm gonna make it sound like this then because you need to get home and get in your yeah. pajamas your authentic self's in in the bath in the bath having the best wow. time copy yeah. Uh, yeah loving life and there's me walking around talking like the Queen. I, it, that was actually a breakthrough moment for me because I thought, it, it, okay, so you don't like going to these places because you're not yourself. You never relaxed. You only like being at home. Um, you like being at work when it's when it's good work. You love being with your boy, and you don't like wearing makeup. You like going to bed at nine, and that's really all you like doing. So so stop doing these other things yeah yeah you're speaking my language entirely like I know <laughs> that's really I think actually the pandemic got me to that place of going oh I really don't have to do that stuff anymore because I haven't done it for a year and a half and I'm way way more relaxed and comfortable than when I was sort of pushing myself to do it I've just thought of something I want to go back to when you were talking about Victoria's looking in the mirror okay and either it's the moment where she's obsessively brushing her hair and she's practicing her patter or it's when she's scribbling lipstick on the wall because she's just everything's falling apart and it's such an interesting point because we all look in the mirror however many times a day but we so read and I'm reading a book at the moment that's made me think of this which is genius and um 
it's by Mel Robbins and it's it's coming out soon and she's coming on the podcast hopefully hopefully and I can't give away too many spoilers of her book but it's so rare that we look in the mirror and we have compassion for that person reflecting back at us yes you're going you're not quite perfect enough so I've got to brush this hair. I've got to get this makeup on so I'm a, I'm a more enhanced version of myself or oh my god I hate what I'm seeing in the mirror it's real anger vitriol or self-berating we rarely look in the mirror and go oh my god it's good you know you're doing all right you're doing yeah hello we don't do it no I know I know and, and and I've been there so many times I mean it's enhanced because when you're in the public eye it, it it's hard I think and it's yeah. when I'm with my family I'm really good at it you know um I, I think I'm much better at going fuck it I'm just in a playground and I'm loudly playing pirates and I don't care what you think of me I've got a five-year-old who wants his mum because I've been away working for you know two weeks and then home for a weekend for nearly nine months because the pandemic shoved all my jobs together I don't care so it's trying to get that I don't care into just when I'm out and or when I'm when I do go to do's um because maybe our um, program's been honored with a nomination of something you know and I and I I do like going to those events because I feel proud to be part of something, especially when there's so much content and something pokes through. You, you're like, oh, my God, wow. OK, I'm speaking to someone and I'm doing my job that the universe has sent me to do. And I feel great about that. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's finding the, the, the level of how to be yourself. And I, and I think when I was in Corrie, and I've spoken about this before and it did get taken out of content. So just to clear something up is... I was 21 just, and um, when I joined as the, uh, a knicker stitcher in the uh, Mike Baldwin's uh, factory, um, I was really, uh, you know, I was, I was a young 21. I, I hadn't lived away from home, and I, I was taken from being a barmaid to suddenly being in Coronation Street. You know, all my family were like, oh my God, she's in Coronation Street. And then I was taken to Barbados on a bikini shoot. And then I was taken to Loaded and Maxim and all those things. And I think the perfection thing in my head, even at 43 now, stems from that because I never asked to do that. Um, I did it, I did it willingly. I did it because I thought it was fun. Um, but I was, but my body was quite curvaceous and it wasn't toned and it was, it was a real, it was a real girl's body. And somehow, not caring and putting that bikini on and being in loaded and whatever throughout the course of getting older and then the public eye being stronger and social media coming in and I think this is where I'm talking to middle-aged women I think the the body image thing has got skewed up and the perfection and the body image thing is somehow from that 21 year old girl to me being 43 that doesn't help with going to do's and being out on the street and people looking at me. Yeah, it's fucking horrible. God, I've <laughs> so, so been there. I mean, I've had pictures taken of me coming out of the sea just after I've breastfed a baby and I've got these big milky tits and stomach hanging out and whatever. <laughs> and, and, you know, no matter how comfortable you might feel in that moment or how body positive you are, no one wants to be picked apart or have circles drawn around body parts and no. it's horrible and it, you know it extends now into everybody's lives because of social media whether in the public eye or not if you're putting yourself out there people can make make commentary of it and it's it's really toxic and there are some great things about social media but the normalization of just this constant dialogue around female bodies is is terrifying it's terrifying mm. and I think yeah. it does play in like if you're a perfectionist being out and feeling that people are looking at you you know I I hate that I like so one of the reasons if I'm really honest that I don't like going out is just yeah me too some people looking at me please I like hiding behind my microphone here like I don't want that and um and I think it's really brilliant to be honest about that especially when it's you know many people might look at someone like yourself Saran, and go oh look she's at the BAFTAs and she's winning award. she looks amazing and you know as you're talking about this now and also you've depicted this in I'm Victoria there's a whole other level to that it's not this sort of 
amazing world that everything is it's all perfect and going swimmingly it's just there's so much more going on there's so much more going on and I think it's really important to break it down in um in Iron Victoria there's this there's this sort of omnipresent tension and it's because you know that Victoria refuses to stop she knows something's not right and she you know but she's just she's ignoring it and she's using distraction techniques and she's just mm. She keeps going, she keeps going, she won't give up, she won't give up. And I think, again, something highly relatable to all of us. I still do it all the time now. Like I know I'm fucking tired or I've really pushed myself too far or whatever, but I don't stop, I don't let myself stop. I continue to push and push and push myself until I do break, always. There'll always be a moment of breaking. And I wonder, you know, was that drawn specifically from life events? Because I know you've talked about this before, you know, you had a tough time in 2018 when, you had done back to back work on some really hard hitting TV and theatre, all of, you know, quite a dark nature. And you're putting yourself in these situations where your characters are going through horrendous things. And from the outside, you know, I don't know firsthand, but it looks like it, it took its toll at that point. So, um, so my mum um, had been sick for many years. So she had an aneurysm and then she, um, she, slowly got worse and she developed, she developed dementia and Parkinson's and she was in her home and um, in 2016 I had my son and then uh, at the end of February and by the end of 2016 I lost my mom um, and I have a picture of the two of them um, and if there was ev ever a new life and end of life picture it would be this because and it's bittersweet because I, I know they met but um, I took him into the nursing home and put him on um, her bed and she's she's tiny and um, she was nearing the end of her life. I didn't know that then, but and he's kicking around and she wasn't able to communicate with us at that time. Um, but I've, I've got it and I and I will hold on to that picture forever. And sometimes I just love it. Sometimes it makes me cry um, as it should. You know, it brings many things. And what I did was I, I went straight into work because I thought, well, I'll take I'll take a job because I want to show that I'm back in the game, which is a whole other conversation of when, you know, when moms, especially actresses, feel like they should say, oh, no, I can do it all. It's, you know, I'm, I'm back. D don't write me off. Um, I, I want to keep my cachet where it is. Um, so I took on a theatre job. Now, God knows why I chose Frozen. I, I, can't, I don't even know to this day why I would choose a subject that was about um, a paedophile and the mother of the child that had died at the hands of this, this paedophile was giving him redemption. It was a 300, it was really difficult. And, um, and I had a very public breakdown on stage in front of the audience and um it, there was a build-up to it that I didn't recognize um and instead of at that point you would think uh, I would stop I thought it's okay I've got this brilliant opportunity gentleman Jack um I'm going to do it because I think it will help me and it, you know what Fern it did to a certain point because Anne Lister is such a beautiful character to portray and god thank you to everyone that's just fallen in love with the show and the fans and and the fact that we were showing this beautiful love story about two lesbians on you know bbc and it and it ended beautifully and it was all it was everything that was just wonderful and needed at that time for me what was going on was i i was filling my day up so i had i was out of the house for 14 hours my family were with me in Yorkshire. Um, when I was dressed as Anne Lister, I was learning lines or I was on set. Um, and then I'd come home, put the baby to bed. He was two and a half then. And then it'd all start again. And then on Saturday I had therapy. Um, I would play with my son. Then on Sunday, we'd have the family planned family breakfast. <laughs> this is all kind of, there are bits from Victoria here and there. Um, and then I would have to learn lines or we'd go to a soft play and I'd learn lines and play. So I was coping. I was having massages. I was doing yoga. I was spraying my pillow sprays. I was listening to the singing 
bells or bowls. So this is where I'm, what I'm talking about is that's unhealthy because I'm trying to control stuff. I'm trying to control the inevitable because I haven't yet grieved for my mother and I, I haven't had, I haven't given myself any time. So after the first gentleman, Jack, I, I had a really big breakdown and I was offered medication and I took it because, um, and I didn't want to kicking and screaming, I took it, but I was so far gone by that point because I'd, I'd had the death of my mother and then I'd gone on to do two huge shows and my husband did not know how to help me. And we could see that all these things that I was trying to grasp onto to keep my life um, well and sorted, they weren't working anymore. They work now. I just want to clarify what I mean about, because I love yoga and I love um, podcasts and um, meditation. I, ne I need them and I love them, but there's a way that they work for me now. Um, and then I went off medication um, after about a year and I felt really good. And then the pandemic hit and, um, and then my dad got sick. And the first um, few days of Gentleman Jack, number two, um, good old Gentleman Jack, <laughs> things always happen when I do that show. Um, I, I got a call from my dad and he was gray and he couldn't breathe. And um, he said that he'd done a COVID test and it was positive so my work gentleman jack sent him a medic and the medic said he needed to go to hospital and then he was there for three months in icu and um and he we kept getting a call to say this might be the end of his life but, so, so you might have to come in in the full PPE and say goodbye to him. And I was trying to do, so I'm still filming at this point and I'm away from home now because my family couldn't be with me. And oh my God, Fern, I can't even, I'm still processing, because I haven't even finished filming Gentleman Jack, that's how new it, it is for me. Um, and we would, we would, I was singing to him at weekends on the phone because the, the nurses, the brilliant nurses were holding the phone up to him. Um, and my, my brother was talking to him and um, they'd just leave the phone on the side for us. And he didn't, he didn't make it. And so eventually I did get to say goodbye, but in the Soko kind of suits and the, and the full PPE. And, and then I got COVID myself at Christmas. And, um, and at that point I felt like I wasn't coping again. So I had to go on medication again. And I think it's important for me to say with you, and I've never said this before, that I'm doing great and I'm still filming my job. And I professionally, I've always been really strong and on point, but I'm, but I'm on medication. And at some point I'll aim to get off that, but I think there's a huge taboo around it. And I, and I wasn't gonna say it, but I think I, I felt like, I decided last night I should because it's it's important I think. It's so important and I'm really um I'm really grateful personally that you you want to go there with that and I'm and I'm so sorry that you've had you've just had to go through so much in the last few years and um it's no surprise that you feel that sense of overwhelm and that you haven't been able to cope because it's that's just so much to process you know alongside us just all collectively going through so much madness um yeah. and for you you know having woven into that very personal loss very in quick succession it's it's um it's remarkable and, and i'm i think a lot of people will be very grateful that you're you're willing to go there and talk about it and and there is such stigma around medication which just shouldn't be the case because as we all know mental health is such a bespoke thing you know even depression will look completely different from one person to the next and you know, I, I was on medication um, probably nine years ago now. And, um, and, and if I ever felt I was to go that low again, 
it would certainly be an option for me because it mm -hmm. saw me through the darkest of times and and often I think there's a real um there's a real importance to allowing yourself to hit rock bottom because all of that treading water constantly I think probably leads to a much bigger crash down the line so I think whether you're you've hit rock bottom once twice three four, it doesn't matter I think it's it's um, really admirable when when you allow yourself or when others around you allow themselves to hit rock bottom and I've only done it once massively um and it and it was a huge rock bottom and you know I stopped working for a bit and I left all the jobs I was doing etc and I, what I what I underestimated was the new era that would follow it and I think it's almost always a given that there has to be newness after you've hit rock bottom because you are yeah. surrendering, you're letting go and you're you're kind of saying out loud, right, I, I give up and I'll, I'll trust in whatever happens next. And it, it, it's hard to trust in life. It's really hard to trust in it. And yeah. think it's going to be OK without any effort or anything from me because rock, rock bottom means you don't have any energy or effort to give. Yeah. So you have to trust in there's going to be something else. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but I mean, I now do all this brilliant work. I didn't know I was going to bloody do all this. I had no clue. It's all just happened by chance because I had no other option. I couldn't go back to doing what I was doing before. There's no, no way. And I, I still can't. I can't do live telly anymore. I can't do that sort of thing. I don't have the strength to do it. Why put yourself through it? Why, Why put myself the, through it? Yeah. But, you know, and, and that's why I say thank you because from whatever happened to you, has brought so many people, you know, with your festival and your books, you know, I've, I've been through your books and done the work pages oh, and, you know, it, it's, it's beautiful. What came from your rock bottom is, has been so beautiful. And I think what came from mine, <clears throat> my few, has, has been that I just, and the pandemic for many people, um, has just been to cling on to what's small and true and um, real in a very changeable, crazy world. And and I think that um, for me, that's my family and my friends and <clears throat> knowing what is going to be good for me. So, I, I, you know, it's not that I'm antisocial. I love having friends around, but I know how many to have now and how to have them. Or if I go for a meal, I know what time I need to have that meal because I might not want to stay up late. Or it's just about learning what's good for you. And Your boundaries. Yeah, yeah. And enjoying so that. Yeah, it is. And I think maybe, you know, we're of a similar age. And as you get older, you start to feel a bit more confident in that. Thinking, you know what, I know that's not going to work for me. Doing what everyone's expecting of me or what's deemed appropriate or what's deemed you know successful in this moment I'm having to go through that a bit myself at the moment and looking at what am I really capable of what can I cope with and maybe it's less than what other people think and and if other people you know don't view what I'm doing as sparkly and shiny or whatever then that's okay and I, so much of it is about acceptance isn't it and um how do you feel now about having moments of retreat maybe you're not you haven't actually had that much time to do it yet because your workload has been so huge but do you feel more comfortable moving into moments where you do totally step back I, I personally don't I I had that one moment of retreat because I had to but I'm still if I'm really really honest and we're being very honest today yeah. shit scared of retreating from what I've built because I don't trust it will stick around right <laughs> yeah that I'm good enough yeah for my thing to revive on its own without me fighting to some extent to keep it all in place and that's that's um again i think you know historically a, a female thing yeah. that's you know that we that we that's just intrinsically there and i think that um no i'm not i, I mean I, I i'll say that i am i'll say that i'm you know not going to work for six months or you know or i might have a year off why don't I do that? And then, of course, I don't. I'm on the phone to my agent saying, well, maybe I'll just do some voiceovers because that'll mm. be OK, because that's not really work, is it? Or maybe I'll do some development work. Um, so I think me stepping back. So we have a production company as well. And um, we bought a couple of books and we, we're looking at 
producing our own stuff. I produce, but I produce with other people at the moment. And I'd love to just start getting my own stuff going. So I feel like the stepping back is about doing something that I want to do and control. Because there's no point in pretending I'm not a control Virgo control freak, you know? There's no point in, yeah, pretending that. Um, so I, I may as well use it to my advantage, again, with my boundaries and be kind of say, OK, well, let's control this bit over here and then we can work when we want to work or we can. I mean, and also the luxury of stepping back, you know, if I had a normal job nine to five, I wouldn't be able to step back in a way that I say that I feel like I need to step back. It's difficult to put it in perspective, isn't it? Because like when I work, I work so hard and so much and so many hours and I may be away from home and it, it it's all encompassing and then I'll get time with my family. So that's the difficulty of being self-employed is that it's not a normal um, routine. So I, I think it's finding a level of just how I'm gonna be more me more regularly and how I'm going to be more me in the public eye more regularly I think because I think that will help me find the next thing yeah it's integrating the two isn't it I think I'm definitely in that place where I'm trying to integrate the real 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 me into a world that feels really on me and you know just seeing how that goes and I think you're so right so much of it is about accepting who we are you know we spend so much of our formative years trying to be like our peers or people that we admire in the public eye, whatever it might be. And then you get to a point where you go, God, that's exhausting. Yeah. I'm just going to be me. And like you, I'm a Virgo control freak. And I, I guess where I'm at now is I'm trying to learn to harness that and use it in a healthy way. But I still know when I tip into the unhealthy side quite regularly. And again, I really saw this in I Am Victoria, that with her element of control and need for control, it bordered at times on sort of self-punishment. And I recognise that in myself, like times when I feel I, I believe I don't deserve good stuff unless, unless there's been a real fight before it or real yeah. concerted sort of effort and maybe a struggle. Otherwise, I think well, I don't deserve just having a nice bit of time off or having something lovely. I don't deserve it. And I, I want to work at that because I know plenty of people that welcome and I'm not talking about abundance in a financial sense or a glitzy sense. I mean, an abundance of like goodness, of, of yeah. health, of love, of, of freedom, liberation, an abundance of all that good stuff. And they welcome it really freely. And that, that's a beautiful thing. I'm not there yet. I still want to put myself through an element of like struggle to then go, oh, yeah, yeah, I deserve that now. And I really could see that in Victoria. Uh, you know what? I walk around our house and, and you know, it's nothing, you know, um, amazing it's just a you know it's, it's a nice London house and um but I walk around it and I still say to my husband aren't we lucky aren't we lucky and, and we are but we've also worked really hard for it so it's that thing of like I mean I you know I was brought up Catholic as well so you know there's mm. a whole thing going on with my um makeup but um yeah that thing of like aren't I lucky to or when you get a job God, I got that, I got that. Well, yeah, but because you're gonna be good for the people you're working for as well, and you're gonna, you know, elevate it in some way that they want you for, it's, it's about, and I don't know why I haven't got there yet with that kind of stuff. Because I, because at 43, I, 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 here's another one, the shoulds. At 43, mm. I feel like I should be there. Well, why? Because mental health is a, a constant thing. So we have to work on it all the time. And, and that's, that's the, that is the big struggle, I think, as well with Victoria. That is why we've ended it how we've ended it. Is that there's no answer to this. And as you um, put it before, everyone's struggle is different. It looks, everyone's struggle looks different. There are elements that you may recognise that, um, that you may watch and go oh is is that me maybe I can talk about how I'm feeling then but really the, the work has to be so she has therapy at the end she decides to go to therapy 
And uh, the therapist says, so you've just started your journey. And that's the point. The end of Victoria is the beginning of Victoria. And there's a bigger conversation around um, what, what the government are going to do about all these people that are feeling the pressure, especially after the pandemic, because therapy is very expensive, expensive if you go privately. And if you go on the NHS waiting list, then it's a huge wait or you only get a certain amount of um, sessions. So, so there's a whole other thing of how you, how are we all going to handle these feelings? I don't know. I worry about it all the time. It's a insurmountable problem, as you said, especially after what we've just lived through. And it scares the shit out of me. You know, even if I'm just texting my circle of friends, I can see how individually certain friends have been really affected and they don't have the time or maybe the finances or maybe they can't get on the waiting list. And and it's it, you know, we're in desperate times in terms of mental health and us being in this sort of crisis, you know, that compounded with the ways we now use the digital world and there's good and very bad in that and social media, et cetera. And it's, it, it's a huge problem and God, you know, none of us have the answers to this, but I think having conversations is at least a good foundation. It might not even be a starting point, but at least it's a foundation that, yeah. you know, we're all having a chat. And I think something just sparked in my head as well there, when you were talking about, you know, you're not sure why you haven't got there yet to a place where, you know, I think a lot of, again, women feel like it. We've got to keep saying, I'm so lucky, I'm so lucky. And, and like you say, many of us have been, you know, born into a family that where we are loved or we have uh, health or whatever it might be. And there are moments that are absolutely lucky. There are moments where hard work pays off and it, none of it was given to you on a plate or, or me on a plate. There's obviously been an element of work with anyone that does something that they love, but we still feel it's bad to say, yeah, I deserve to be here. You know, I don't think any of us feel comfortable with that, but there are so many correlations between depression and low self-worth. I mean, I can see it in myself so clearly. I don't have to dig around much to look, at, look for that. My yeah. self-worth is shit a lot of the time. Yeah. One of the only times my self-worth is intact is in these conversations because I'm not trying to prove myself. I'm not trying to do anything apart from enjoy learning and listening and giving people space. But outside of it, in my real life, being a mum, being a wife, in other areas of my career, oh my God, my self-worth is on the floor. Yeah. And, you know, maybe I'd expected that when I got to this point of my life, I wouldn't be dealing with that, but I am. So that's that. And that, isn't that important? That, that, that exactly, like we can, we can have these conversations and, and I can tell you how much good you're doing and I, and I can go and listen to a million podcasts and be like me too god me too me too and I'll feel amazing and then I'll walk into the house and something will happen and I'll just be like oh why didn't that work because it's just an ongoing thing and I and like you said as a foundation there is a community of people and and on social media it, it it's great because you can follow whoever you want to follow and there are some brilliant people with brilliant techniques and stories and things to share that you can just hold on to and when you're feeling a bit wobbly you can go to and I think that's that's brilliant and it's and it certainly helped me but it is it's an ongoing conversation and and as yet there is there is no there is no answer to it and <clears throat> I think with Victoria we just wanted to it is a bit of a me too you know as in like don't worry um, representation is important to me with most of my shows. I mean, as we were talking about Gentleman Jack before, and um, Victoria is is my version of the job that you do. You know, it's my it's my version of saying, I see you, and and I'm just sending you a love through this program. Um, and I think for what I was talking about before, um, Together by Dennis Kelly and um, Sharon Horgan and um, um, James McAvoy, there was, uh, about the pandemic, there was a beautiful speech that Sharon did about um, her mum in the hospital and it described exactly what I've just described to you and I have never felt happier that I was represented on TV and some people think, you know, being an actress is um, a bit flouncy or, you know, well, well you, you just, you just piddle around a bit don't you and say a few lines and actually 
when I got my moment of seeing myself and re reflection, I, I kind of held my husband's hand and said, oh my God, that's me, that's me. It was so important to me. And my brother called me the other day and he's having a bit of a tough time with um, dad going. And he said he understood what I went through with mum now because he's having his wobbles. And for the first time he understood mental health in a way I've not heard him say before. So I think, I think we're doing good by, by this. And that's why I'm glad it's taken me to, to today to come and talk to you because uh, I feel like I've, I'm okay with being me and opening up like this. I feel okay yeah. about it. And also, I think it's, we're moving, we're, you know, collectively, we move into dangerous territory when certain people, because of what their life looks like or because of any circumstance, don't feel that their experiences of mental health or illness, because they're very different things, but, you know, daily mental health versus having mental illness. Um, is is not valid it's really dangerous when we go oh well you can't have depression or you know I, I certainly had a little bit of that when my first book came out because it was out of the blue I'd been you know happy person on the tv for years and years since I was a kid and then all of a sudden a book about depression and people are like how can you be depressed or you know what do you know yeah, what's about wrong it? with you yeah, yeah exactly and <laughs> you know although I uh, I'm you know appreciate and have friends who are in you know perhaps worse life circumstances well, I've got some friends who've been through some terrible shit um but they would never judge me or and also I I never go into too many details about my own backstory and ways because I haven't made peace with it yet yeah, yeah I yeah. talk about things that I've made peace with and that is quite a lot of stuff so I'm <laughs> I feel like I can I can root around in that and hopefully it's it's helpful and it it connects us but we're in dangerous territory when we look at, you know, someone like you, Saran, who's got this amazing career and who's so talented or whatever and say, well, how can you be on medication? How can you have to? That's dangerous. We've got to. Yeah, we've got to create conversation where everybody's experience is valid. It doesn't matter what caused it, what you know, what the reaction looks like, yeah. what, what the life looks like. Our brains are so complex and, you know, I like so for instance the other day I was having a really major low and I felt the shittest I'd felt in so long and I had a bit of a cry and I sort of sat there just staring out the window for ages then I did a podcast with Catelyn Moran who just switched up my whole energy and by the end of the day I was sort of back to feeling all right again and if you've seen me from the outside you wouldn't really have a clue what was going on but my brain was firing off all these thoughts and visions of the future and things from the past and we don't know what's going on in someone's no. head. We just don't have a clue. And, and I think we have to find much more compassion towards each other and ultimately ourselves for, to make any progress. Yeah, I think it, uh, that was a brilliant episode, by the way. What oh, um, she, she's a brilliant amazing. conversation. Yeah, um, I, I think I think I think what what is important is the what it looks like. And I think that was important to Dominic and the team as well. What does it look like? Because right, like, like I said, right now, I'm on holiday, I'm having a great time, love my family, um, still filming Gentleman Jack, managing to juggle all sorts of stuff, really happy actually. And yes, I have my up and down days. Yes, I was sweating like you wouldn't believe before um, I started this conversation with you. Um, I'm on, I'm on holiday, we suddenly wash my hair for you and then realised I didn't have a hairdryer. I was like, oh, fuck. Um, yes, I went into a slight meltdown. But, but really, as you say, I'm, I'm more than functioning, you know, but yet this, but I'm still talking to my doctor and I have therapy every week and, and that's okay. That's that's good because I've got the help I need. So maybe if someone looks at Victoria and starts to speak out about how they're feeling because of seeing or recognizing something in her, I'll be fucking thrilled that it's just helped a person. You will, you know, you were undoubtedly you you will there's there's the, the, you know like I said there were so many moments where I reckon I, I I remember the time when I'd been feeling super out of control and I had two 
members of my team coming to the house that I really respect and I did not feel mentally in a great place and I tidied the kitchen to an inch of its life I put this really nice white shirt on and when I was making them coffee in a cafetiere the whole thing exploded over my white shirt <laughs> of, course it did. of course it did and half of it half of me wanted to like cry my eyes out and go I'm just not coping and the other half was like you fucking idiot do you know what I mean? yeah what are you doing and watching I'm Victoria made me go I am never to get to that point again yeah where I'm trying to on an outside exterior level try and control what's yeah. going on in my head they don't correlate I can't no. do that anymore I can't do that anymore and that's why so many people will be helped and there's there's also you know we've got to focus on what you've just talked about there which is essentially self-awareness you're aware now of not only your boundaries but of what's going to work so yes you might be feeling happy right now in this moment we don't know what's going to happen to any of us in the next hour let alone yeah. tomorrow but you talking to a doctor, having therapy at the moment, being on medication works for you versus in 2018, where, as you said earlier, you didn't feel anything coming on. You perhaps on a subconscious level knew and there were things that didn't feel right, but not enough for you to take action. So what's better, sort of suffering in silence and ignoring your own inner cry or where you're at now, which is, you know, doing things that you know work and even if you are feeling happy still putting the effort and the work in to ensure you stay there it, it yeah. I think it boils down a lot to knowing yourself I guess doesn't it yeah and and so you asking me about taking the step back uh, am I happy with that well I do want to work I want to do the work that I want to do but I do need to have space for myself so I think that's what I'm I'm ultimately trying to work on and my husband would love this too if I if I just created more family space because I I I want to go and take my son to the school gates more often I want to do that so that I'm my my brain knows I'm a mom more often you know it's like I don't want to just be um you know working away and um then coming home and being a manic mum at a weekend where I'm I'm playing games that even he's like I've had enough of that game now why are you still kind of dressing up and <laughs> being weird you know and I'm going what do you want to do next let's, let's play this game let's and my husband's like calm down so so it's finding it's finding that that's what I would I'd like to have it it's it's that balance again I think um but god I, we're not no one's perfect and um god the other day just that really made me laugh because the other day um i had brand new white sheets and threw the coffee at myself because i had my glasses on and um with the coffee hand i went to move my glasses up and moved it up like move. <laughs> and just pulled all the coffee all down the white sheets i mean <laughs> what a dick and then and then ordered a rug that was five times too big for the living room area because oh, I didn't check that. on the thing and it's on its way now so you know that'll be a pain in the ass to send back whatever um it, it's okay to be a bit of a dick and to, yes. you know it's fine it's so fine and but don't you know, get yourself in a, 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 the point is don't get yourself so wound up that you can't come down from it be a dick it, great you know dick. but I think a lot of this and you can see it in I'm Victoria is driven by fear and I see it in myself and it's a fear that we're not being a good enough mum we're not being on it enough in the house we're not being a good enough person in our career we're not being enough we're so scared of being sort of found out someone's going to tap us on the shoulder and say you're not being a, a good enough parent or whatever it might be there's such a fear and with Victoria that morphs into this sort of martyrdom because and it's such a fine line isn't it between you want to help you want to be in the mix versus I'm going to put myself so at the bottom of the pile and make the house look amazing. My kids are in the right outfits. I've cooked the amazing volivants for my friends. I've done everything <laughs> to make everybody else happy. And you're somewhere so at the bottom of the pile 
And of course, that doesn't serve anyone because you're fucking miserable. Everyone can feel it and there's a tension. And I've slipped into that so many times. And then obviously I do what Victoria does in the thing. Why haven't you put the fucking pillows on the bed or whatever it might be? You know, yeah, you yeah. Lose your the shit. little things. You think you're doing everything for everyone, whereas you're not. You're just trying to control stuff. And when someone yeah. doesn't live up to your expectations, you blow your lid again. Like, it's such a fine line because but we're driven by fear. It's such a horrid, toxic fear that we don't, we're not valid. We shouldn't exist in this world because we're not ticking all the bloody boxes. People like Victoria redoes um, her males because she sounds a bit arsy. So then she redoes it so she sounds nice. The fear of um, people aren't going to like her. You know, my fear of um, oh people are just going to think I'm annoying. Uh, oh people are people are if I'm strong at work, people are going to think I'm a diva. Um, uh, you know, again things that we are blessed with um, historically. You know. Actually, no, I can just put my foot down if I, if I believe it's right. Um, or the way that she, I mean, it's quite funny, I laugh at it now, but when she's making a nice dinner and then, and you think, oh, she's got it together a bit. And then she starts to dictate what time everyone goes home and how much everyone's gonna drink. And because the fear of if she starts to get tired, then she's gonna be the boring one. So it has to be her husband that kind of like sets those rules so she can look a certain way. And I think for so long, and I'm, I, you know, I haven't got this right yet. I still haven't. But for so long, I was just in fear of what people were gonna think of me all the time. Fear, um, even, even before I came on here, what's she gonna think of me? So it's still there, but it's more low level. And, you know, I think that as my mom was um, a very nervous person and you know we'd go in posh shops and um, she she would walk in and she'd kind of look at the things and then she'd say no let's go because she didn't feel like she was good enough to be in the posh shops on King Street in Manchester I remember um, going shopping with her and then she also had breast cancer when she was very young um, my age actually and so then her self-esteem um, went low because she had a mastectomy and um, I think all that has kind of filtered into me as well of kind of like not feeling good enough um, and obviously the place it came from with my mom was her self-esteem but but with me mixed with being in the public eye it's turned into that um, what you what do you all think of me and that is such a big thing to there's no answer to that is there of like how no. how do we let go of because you can't just live your life of, of of not worrying what anyone thinks of you I don't I don't believe that and I don't think you should really because because you've got to mind your own um persona haven't you in a way you know I think all you can do is maybe like I try and do this dissect. Well, what does it mean if someone doesn't like me? You know, right. what, yeah. what does that mean? Does it mean that I'm wrong? Is that my fear? Maybe my fear is being wrong. You know, I think a lot of the time I think I'm getting life wrong. So my fear yeah. is if someone says I am, they're right. And then, oh my God, my feeling was right. I'm getting life wrong. Yeah. And then it goes back to the inner work. Oh, I've got to work on that to know that nobody really has a bloody clue what they're doing in life, all stumbling through, none of us have a fucking clue. And, you know, and I feel the same every time I do a podcast, I really hope that the guest feels heard and understood and that they um, have enjoyed it and felt comforted. And I almost don't want that to go because otherwise yeah. I'll probably get a bit complacent. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I think you're right, you know, it's a healthy balance, isn't it? Of, 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 of not losing it so that you become so unbelievably sort of overly confident and um, you don't give any thought to what anyone else is thinking, but you don't let it, you don't drown in it, which I, I've certainly done. I, I've felt so drenched in it that I can't even speak publicly. And it's, you know, one of the reasons I struggle now to do anything outside of my own comfort zone with Happy Place, because yeah. I don't know how to do that anymore. But what you just said about right and wrong, 
I think that's interesting. That's really because because we're taught at school what's right and wrong, right yeah. from an early age. Not so much now, I don't think. I think our children, I think our generation, you know, suffer from this more. But I think the right and wrong thing, it, yeah. So that's so that's the answer, isn't it? Really, it's about kind of well, your version of life isn't the same as my version of life, and my mate's version of life, who still loves going clubbing and cocktails, you know on the beach at six because they're still up that's their version of life and it's fucking great but yeah. so is mine I love my version of life and it involves baths and pajamas and you know if you want to meet me it's got to be a breakfast or lunch date really because oh, that's same. when I I'm happiest and you'll get the best from me you know same. you know I've never ever had a dinner party never <laughs> <laughs> because that it's thing stressful. that when Victoria's like, I need them to go, is such yeah. a worry for me. Yes. I don't want someone in my house still at midnight because I'll be asleep on the fucking sofa. I can't right. do it. I'm a morning person. So like yeah. you, if you want to come to my house, I will put on the most lovely lunch and we can chat all day. Yeah. But as long as you fuck off at a certain <laughs> point, I'm ready to go to bed. We're good. And I think everyone yeah. sort of knows that of me now. And it's like, exactly. Like, but I think you're so right. It's, it's finding your version of life. There is no right or wrong. It's your version. And I think to get, you know, it's been so interesting talking to you today. And I really hope that we either get the chance to do it again or we just keep talking regardless of whether it's yeah. on a podcast or not. Because I feel like we're at a very similar stage where we're figuring that one out. We're starting yeah. to find a bit of comfort in our version of life. And it, you know, mine won't be the same as yours, vice versa, like with anyone, but we're at a similar period finding that comfort and and it's it's a good place to be yeah I'll come to yours for breakfast for a really really good breakfast and bring my two annoying sausage dogs oh I'd love I would love that so much Let, let's please do that and yeah and I can't thank you enough I feel a very privileged that you trusted the space and happy place and myself to to be part of this conversation today and I've bloody loved it Oh, so have I. I love you. I love everything that you're doing. And um, yeah, I've loved it. Thank you. I've, oh. I feel like I want to cry now. <laughs> me too. I did at the start. I was like, fuck <laughs> me, this is going to wreck me from start to finish. Thank you, Saran. You're so welcome. <laughs>